If your faith is based entirely on experience and good vibes and all of those good things, vibes. you know, then people will search that yeah. for their whole life. I know. Right. Jump from belief to belief. Right. Welcome back to Jesus versus America. Jesus told us that we couldn't follow two masters. So many of us are trying to follow the American culture while trying to follow Jesus. I'm John, and I'm joined by my friends Monique and Wisdom. This is a podcast for young adults where three generations are faithfully trying to follow Jesus and talking about the issues we see along the way. And because we're a podcast for young adults today, our focus is going to be mostly on you as a young adult, especially if you're struggling to hang on to your faith, or you might be somebody who's doing really well with your faith at the early part of your 20s. And our podcast today is entitled How to Lose Your Faith by 30. Of course, it's a little tongue in cheek because our whole podcast is dedicated to helping people not to lose their faith and to work through the issues that commonly trip people up. Uh, but at the same time, we know that this is one of the most crucial times in your faith. And so we want to highlight like four areas that we think are, are easy to fall into that would probably lose you to or lead you to lose your faith. The statistics say that two-thirds of young adults drop out of church for at least a year, sometime between the ages of 18 and 22. I've been doing this for two decades, and I can tell you that's definitely true. Uh, and it's usually longer than a year. And then that's where the stats kind of end their agreement. A lot of people think, well, those young adults eventually come back. But in reality, it's taking longer and longer for many people to come back after they've dropped out. And our muscle memory for church is often gone for being part of the body of Christ. It's just lost to us. And so many stay away. Of course, some of the issues we're going to deal with today might be reasons that help people. Uh, some of the reasons, by the way, are as mundane as people move and just have a hard time finding a new church. But we're going to talk about some other issues that come in. So here's the first one that I think is one of the fastest ways to lose your faith by 30, and that is to ask a question that you don't know the answer to about your faith and then just leave it that way. Yeah. <laughs> um, anybody had any experience in this area lately? Not me, but in people who are like, oh, I, um, I used to be a Christian, but God doesn't this say this in the Bible. I could never adhere to I could never adhere to that. And I'm like, where did you get that in the Bible? And they're walking around with this like false statement and and they're like, I'll never go to church because of a false statement that they're just spewing out and not asking looking for answers for. <laughs> yeah, we can all ask a question we don't know the answer to. And we've covered some of this in a previous podcast, but one that recently was asked was somebody said, I don't understand how Moses could have known about the things that happened before the flood. Right. right when he was writing those books of the Bible, and 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 I thought that was the question. I don't understand how Moses could have known. And I thought you're right. You don't understand yeah, how yeah, Moses yeah. could have known. <laughs> um, but imagine if you just left the question there. So yeah. you thought, and 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 I want to point out that I don't think it's really a question. I actually think it's a statement. Like I don't understand how that's possible. And then the silent part that they don't say out loud is, so therefore I've decided that this can't be true. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And, and I'll never I, understand. I don't want to understand. Yeah. Because it's an attitude, right? <laughs> Not really a question. Yeah. Like it, you're, they're yeah. telling us the reason, like, I don't want to believe in this. Yeah. And I found my reason. Right. Which is stated as a question, by the yeah. way. And that and that's kind of more, one of the more, I mean, I guess I shouldn't say lighthearted questions. I mean, kind of, but if it if it takes you out of your faith, maybe it's not so light or you're just looking for an excuse. But there are heavier questions, you know, as well. And it's so cliche. Mm. And it, maybe it comes from, like, the privilege of having asked my questions and grappled with things already, but just, like, the problem of, like, evil. How can evil exist? Why does God allow evil to exist? Why do bad things happen to the innocent, especially? I'm not even going to say to good people, but bad things happen to anyone, to children. Mm -hmm. uh, why are some people healed? And I was praying for, you know, my uh, family member to be healed, and they weren't. They were lost. Like, mm -hmm. um, so there are some deeper Deep. questions. And yeah. those ones are, I even asked those from time to time, <laughs> but some of the questions are even like, how come the Bible doesn't empower women? And then you're like, it was the but most- it does. It does. It was the most empowering <laughs> document for women at its time, but it, that's another one. Or how come yeah. the, there's slaves in the Bible, so the Bible uh, condones slavery. It's like it's telling a story. Yeah. There's a slave in the story. And it, things like that. So yeah. apart from the ones that I asked too, I feel like the ones that people have 
also questions are, are kind of stupid ones that lack even a push-up of study. I just want to pause and point out that we just demonstrated our generational biases right there. Uh, <laughs> so I'm in Gen X, right? You're you're a millennial, you're in Gen Z. And and I've I've said that my generation wanted to know if God existed, right? And your generation wanted to know if God was good. That's why they were so focused <laughs> on things like, That's like why it was suffering so and evil. Because right? I've heard uh-huh. it right, so right. many times. All those things. Like, and you want to know. Apologetics 101, right? how yeah. to answer this like, question. Is, like, it's not, I, like, even if he exists, I want to know, is God good? And your generation wants to know if God's inclusive. Right. <laughs> right? Of the like, woman like, and like the slip. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, wow. And it's just, it's just, it just <laughs> demonstrates, like, how our generations <laughs> approached it. Yeah. And I think it is interesting because ultimately what it really Really does and when I when I see that, I, I feel like what it, while we're doing is reflecting our cultural attitudes back on right. God. Like inclusivity is such a huge deal for yeah. Gen Z. Yeah. So then God therefore must meet the test of exclus- inclusivity yeah. to be yeah. to 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 exist, right? Yeah. And 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 He must meet the test of goodness and then that kind of thing. But those questions are important, and I agree with you that I picked kind of what I would consider kind of an easier question. Yeah. Um, only to point out that it is something you could look into. Like you could say, well, let's actually understand how the scripture was transmitted up until a time a person yeah. like Oral Moses tradition. could have written yeah. it down. Passed down generation right. to generation. Or let's understand how some of these books might have been edited. For example, at the end of the books of Moses, there's a description of how he died. I don't think he wrote that. You know, like mm-hmm. he was too busy dying, you know? <laughs> so so like there, there are questions that we can ask if we're intellectually honest and go right. a layer deeper and then another layer deeper. Yeah. And what does it mean that this was passed on through oral tradition? And what does it mean that, that maybe Moses didn't write every word yeah. in the books of Moses because somebody must have written about his death? Like, what does that mean? To, and how do we understand that? And right. we don't even need to get to like, what was biblical scholarship saying unless we want to, right? But to just say, I don't understand and how then, it is, yeah. or even your tougher questions like, well, I don't see how God could allow this suffering and evil. Right. But I don't want to investigate any further. Right. That's the thing is the investigation. Yeah. Or or sometimes, I mean, people will get something right and they'll be like, well, since the Bible says that and I can't imagine, they put God in a box. I can't imagine a God that would ever say that or do that. So right. I'm out. But there's always ways to understand. There's always ways to understand. And it's like, let's look at like historically what was happening. Um, the Bible is so, it's nuanced in a lot of ways. And faith is nuanced in a lot of ways. And I think that there are certain things that are black and white, that are simple, that you absolutely shouldn't lose your faith over something that you could take a little bit of time to research and actually have an answer. And for the things that are more nuanced, because let's be honest as well, there's like a lot of faith and tension that goes into studying and theology, and not everything is going to be 100% black and white. But for me, what's like really kept my faith is even stretching my brain to understand the nuance and the tension and to know this might not be 100% like black and white answered, but here's everything surrounding the topic. Even that in itself can give you what you need to just keep going. And it's important to stretch our brains and to understand the nuance and not just the black and white, yes, no, this is what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that when you open up the scriptures or even just open up research, it it provides answers. Uh, And like you said, let's be honest, we're not gonna answer every single thing, uh, but there is work to be done that many of us don't wanna do. And that's why I think this point is, yes, just anybody, it's a lazy parlor trick to ask a question you don't know the answer to, and then use that. Uh, For a while, I used to feel like I was the researcher that I had to go find the answers for everybody, and (laughs) and I still do that to some extent, but I had a young man who said, I can't believe in Jesus because every story about Jesus is found in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. And it came hundreds of years before uh, the Gospels were written. And so the Gospels copied it. And I thought, you know, I just looked at him. I said, wow, you know, if that's true, that would shake my faith, you know. Yeah. Uh, have you looked into it? Where'd you hear about that? And he's like, I saw it on YouTube, you know, which, of course, don't believe anything on YouTube, including Gosh. us, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so We're on YouTube. Like, like we're on YouTube. So, so yeah. I thought to myself... Like, well, I need to go check that out. Like, I'm curious. This is an argument that in all my, all my years I haven't heard. And I found a resource where they actually put the two, like, here's the Gospels, here's the this book that he was citing, and showed all of the rays that wasn't true. And I was excited. I'm like, look, someone's even done the homework for us. Yeah. No interest. No interest whatsoever. Because 
what the question gave him was kind of like a safe harbor, which is, I don't have to take any of this seriously uh, yeah. because I asked a question and I yeah. think I've stumped everybody. Oh, my intelligence is in the questions I can ask to undo your thing. Right. And it's like real intelligence is finding the answers to those questions that you have. I think that's what we want everybody to hear. Like we can all ask questions we don't know the answers yeah. to. Uh, all that means is that we have an answer. That, by the way, you could do research and you still might not have the answer. Right. But it, it really just means you don't have the answer. You don't have the complete thing. But it's right. really lazy not to even investigate deeper. Until it's faster to just leave the faith and just call yourself. It is. And if you want to do that, just come to us. We'll write you a hall pass. That's what we always say. Like, if you <laughs> just want out, like, we'll send you a hall pass and you could just go straight. You don't have to ask a bunch of questions and cause all your friends you to struggle to with do you. That, yeah. You don't and, have and, to. Or you can say, and this is the harder part. I need to find good sources. And I know that's easy to say. And this is one of the biggest questions I always get when I say that. Well, how do I find good sources? How do I know what to trust? And that is a skill yeah. that you have to develop. It took me years of learning to research, like, which things are legitimate sources, which things I should suspect when I see them. And by the way, this is true of almost every Christian site I go to. Yeah. I'm always like, I'm not sure like, that these people are qualified <laughs> to address this. Yeah. What is this? Is this too fluffy? It is a skill you have to develop, but the only way to develop it is to sit under someone who can help you, or you just do it enough that you start to build a sense of like, this is a better source than that source, yeah. you know, or I've done it enough. And all of us have done research about yeah. stuff in school. It's a good muscle to flex. You need to flex it. Just to I, sharp, sharpen that skill. Yep. If you're going to ask a question, ask it as a student at the very least. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. So there's like, there's two, two sides of this, right? So it's the person that's going to ask the question because they already got one foot out the door and they want to leave the faith and you might be clinging to that excuse, which you don't need an excuse, just yeah. walk away. Um, but for those of you that do have questions, don't sleep it under the rug. Yes. Because if you if you genuinely, you're not even coming from a place of pride or like I have one foot out, but you genuinely like, well, that's weird. That's a question and you're afraid and you don't ask, you don't research. And then another one and then another one. And um, I watch a, a Mormon podcast and they call it like, putting an elf on a shelf or like, and then eventually that shelf breaks, like what made your shelf break? And they'll talk about how they weren't allowed to ask or even seek answers. So things just start loading on until it snaps. Mm -hmm. So we can be like funny about it and be like, you have one foot out the door, but I just want to like address, like it's totally normal to have questions. You should have questions. You should like know why you believe and investigate and keep your heart open to that and do it like in a responsible way with good sources and supported, but don't sweep them under the rug because mm -hmm. If you're someone that has faith and and you're not with the one foot out the door and you really are like, is it possible to lose my faith by 30? Like people really, I couldn't even imagine that happening to me. I remember I've known John very, very long time, 20 years, more than 20 years. And I remember at one of our young adults, you read the statistic of how many people fall out and you're like, look to your right, look to your left. More than half of you won't be here. I was like, there's no way. True story. Almost everyone in that group has left their faith. So it's real. So if, if you're someone who cares about your faith, you're like, that'll never be me. But you're wondering how people end up there. It could be you. You don't want to end up there. So in all seriousness, if you start having questions, be the student, be inquisitive, find the answers and like really research and and don't be afraid to do that. I'm glad you're addressing the people who aren't using it as an excuse. The yeah. people mm -hmm. who just think there'll yeah. never be a question I can't answer. And then, well, we and all then one have day, questions. Yeah. yeah. And so you use the elf on a shelf example. I use like the unexploded bomb. Like all these questions, if you don't address them, if you just keep stuffing them down and thinking it's not faithful to ask these questions, it's wrong to have these doubts. I don't want to address them. They're going to blow up someday. That's and what I'm your saying. faith will go with it. Yeah. I mean, so that That's earlier real. group that you talked about that we led, yeah, a lot of those people uh, were there basically out of cultural Christianity and, and they didn't make it. The second iteration of that group where we allowed people to ask questions, questions wrestle grapple. with doubts, interrupt at any time, bring your deepest, darkest like fears about Christianity or the things that keep you up, that we reversed the stats on because yeah. then people felt like, okay, look around. Everybody's feeling this. Right. Everybody's going through this. And look, they're still following Jesus despite some of these things. Right. And that means that there's so a different. way to have faith, right? It is. So 
I think we should address the person who's too lazy to find the, mm-hmm. the answer, but we should also address the person who's afraid to of ask, the question. Yes, yeah. to right? search what, it, what right. it's going to mean if they search. Yeah. Or to be in a community where if you asked, you'd be shut down. Yeah. You need to take responsibility at that point because if you just keep stuffing that down, yeah. it's going to break and, you And we have point. a whole other entire podcast on deconstruction because it kind of yep. leads yes. that way. So you guys should check that one out. Um, because there are healthy ways. We talked about, like, I used to look at deconstruction as a positive thing, not to tear your faith apart and leave it that way, but to do it in a responsible way where you are absolutely free to question and ask and seek and do that with other believers and, like, find, you know, what the Bible has to say, what these sources have to say about it. And it's so important because it does come down to the question. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the number two way of, and these aren't like statistical, so we don't put these in order, but this is just (laughs) from our experience, the second best way to lose your faith by 30 is to be unprepared to address difficulties and suffering in this life and in the life of those around you. And basically to believe what I call a subtle form of the prosperity gospel. And I'm not talking about like the health and wealth gospel of, you know, owning your own plane and having all of those things. I mean, the version of the gospel that we believe that if I just put my life in Jesus, everything will go well in this life. Nothing will ever go bad. And to be unprepared when something actually happens. And that brings us back to your question is why does God allow suffering and evil And working out that question in advance, understanding God's nature. When you're not in the mire of the pain and the despair. It's faith insurance. Yeah, because you need it in advance, right? And that's a lot of people think like, I don't want to think about those things or... I'm not, I don't want to dwell in theology like that. That just seems too intellectual and theological to understand God at that level. The problem is when the suffering comes and Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, Take heart, I've overcome the world. Uh, But that doesn't necessarily mean that that overcoming will occur in this life. Mm -hmm. Like many of us will be going along following Jesus and something will befall us, right? It could be tragedy from another person. It could be somebody next to us. It could be in our own life. It could be an illness. It could be something that leaves us questioning God. Financial struggles. Right. Because of his goodness. And if you're unprepared, I think that's one of those places where people can't reach you anymore. Yeah. Right? Because you're in it, right? Now it's probably not the time for us to sit down and talk about why God allows suffering (laughs) and evil, you know? Yeah. So how do we address that person who might like be thinking, that's not me yet. You know, they're thinking, oh, that's an interesting one. What do you do to get ready for that? What do we do to get ready for the fact that that could come about? How do we understand God in that way? You got to be around, first of all, like good teaching and people who you can trust, who can speak into that. So assess that first, like who you can go to with those questions. But I think um, it's just a responsible thing if you want to keep your faith by 30. If you see the title and you're like, oh, I, I don't want to be a statistic of a young adult that just loses their faith. I had a similar experience as you um, in my first, my freshman year philosophy class at the Christian college I went to, my our professor, and, and Christian colleges has a bunch of like really Christian kids, you know, like not the like legit ones sometimes. It's like very culturally Christian kids. And he sits us all in this classroom and he goes, all right, raise your hand here if, if you're a Christian. And of course, everyone like raises their hand. He goes, um, yeah, over half of you aren't going to be raising your hand by the time you hit 30. He said 30 also at that time. Um, and so that, I remember him bringing that statistic up to me. and was like, that's not going to be me. So one, you have to have a determination to not lose your faith and then and, and bring this up of um, how, do you, how do you wrestle with um, awful things happening and, and suffering in this world? Um, it has to come from a deter- determination to keep your faith because when it does happen, because everyone's going to go through so much crap in this lifetime. You will not come out un- unscathed. Um, what are you? Go- what What is your theology of suffering? And, and when it happens, are you going to be prepared for that? Um, what is your view of God? Who are the people you can reach out to even? Even if it's like you're not a complete, you're, com- you're accomplished in your theology of suffering, do you have people, if the insurance is even people to reach out to at the very least, even amongst the suffering? If When I'm going through something, I go to John still like, you and Lena's house all the time. And I'm like, why would God let this happen? And I have them set up a relationship with them that I can go to them in the, in the middle of it also, um, with also a theology of suffering as well. So I would say it would have to come from this determination of that is not going to be me. I will not be someone that loses their faith by 30. I will not be a statistic. I'm going to want to be prepared for that because it's going to happen to you. A hundred percent of people 
will go through suffering of some kind. So yeah. Yeah, and then learning how to suffer, like we follow a, a Messiah who suffered, right? Mm-hmm. And so we have an example mm-hmm. of God coming to reveal his best disclosure of himself to us in the person of Jesus who suffered, yeah. yes. right? Uh, throughout his life and ministry, right? Had to flee for his loss, life. Suffered yep. loss, physical pain, trauma, all emotional it, right? pain, mental like pain. Homelessness as a young child being pursued, like all yes. the things, right? Poverty, all the things. All of it, right? And and so that example should inform us. Like there was a period <laughs> in my himself life- himself did not spare right. himself. Yeah. Right, and so then we think we, you know, by following him, like to. all will go well, right? And, and maybe it will. And there are many of us that we have no idea how much stuff God withholds from allowing it to yeah. happen, right? Mm-hmm. So so there's a part of his grace that we can't even see of all the bad stuff yeah. that could happen in this world, in a broken world, that he's actually withholding from allowing to happen. Yeah. But but there are things that happen. And I remember in my life, like one of the things was, you know, uh, uh, m- m- we were sued for $3 million and this lawsuit went up for like two years. And this was devastating, especially to a lawyer who knows all the bad things that could happen in a lawsuit. Uh, and this, it, it was so unjust in my life because I had nothing to do with this case. I was dragged into it for no reason. And the next thing you know, we're going through this thing where we could lose everything over this, right? So every day there was this like thing. But I remember that what I was turning to is, Jesus, how did you suffer? Like, how did mm-hmm. you go through this? Like, mm-hmm. I, I would go back to Jesus' prayer in the garden over and over, like, not not my will, but yours. Yeah. Like, of mm-hmm. course I want this cup to pass. Of course yeah. I don't want to be in this situation. And I would just cry out like, God, you see me. You see what's going on. Yeah. You see how stressed out I am. You know what's happening. You could stop it, but for some reason you're letting it go on. And mm-hmm. I don't understand the reason mm-hmm. and I don't know what's going on. And of course I want you to stop it, but you know what? As long as it continues, like I need to say the same thing, which is I'm surrendered to you, yeah. not my will, but yours. And, and to trust that it's... Whatever you're going to do. And not yeah. to believe, oh, and in the end, it's going to all work out yeah. and everybody's going no, to... I'm going to use it as a sermon that, example. But, no, it's, but to it, trust that yep. God is it's whatever's going to happen is what's supposed to happen and that he's going to get you through right. it and to have that kind of trust not that it's going to go your way but that he's going to get yeah. you through it and, and to say like if you didn't spare your own son from this yeah. like yeah. what am I, I mean i'm i'm a broken man i'm a sinful man like i've done things wrong you know so how am i standing here thinking this is so unjust i mean it is in this case, yeah. But but I'm a person living in a broken world who contributes that brokenness every day, right? Mm-hmm. Right. And so when some of that brokenness comes on me, how am I so shocked? It's mm-hmm. the pride. You know? That's the danger. Mm-hmm. It's the pride of. That's why I love. Uh, is it Philippians two three where it's like, um, like don't concern yourself with vain conceit, but like position other people's, consider them better than yourselves. And it talks about how God being God didn't even cling to the rights of being God when he was on earth. So it's that reminder that if even God humbled himself to that situation, Mm -hmm. like who are we? And not who are we in a self like deprecating kind of like, you know, not, not like that, but, but really it's like the breaking of that pride, like none of us will be untouched by grief. Mm -hmm. This is a broken world. It's humanity. And we don't want it, but there isn't something that like precludes us. Like, well, I don't deserve everyone else, maybe, but not me. And if you can break yourself of that, mm-hmm. you know, I always tell people it's about learning how to suffer well and wait well. And yeah. sometimes it will hit you way earlier in life. I was involved in junior junior high ministry um, with these girls. Took them from sixth to eighth grade, and I kind of went in a different way. And I'm like, I'm going to bring up these heavy topics now to, to prepare these kids. Mm-hmm. Like it's junior high. Like, let's talk about what does it mean that God is good? And do we need to stretch our idea of what good means? And what if you don't get? So we're beginning these studies for a few months. Didn't know that one of the kids' fathers was dealing with kidney failure mm. and needed a transplant and all these things. And, and we started talking about it. And I asked her straight up, like, and it was a tight group of girls and it was a safe space. So if God chooses not to save your dad and this doesn't, mm-hmm. like, what does that mean for you? Like, mm-hmm. and not in a mm-hmm. give me the right answer. I just, like, how do you feel? Yeah. And she was like, no, that that doesn't mean that God isn't good. That That is what I want to go into is, is our, what is, what is banking on God's goodness? How is your, that's how you can measure your faith is like, if this doesn't happen, is God not good, good anymore? Yeah. Is he still good? Yeah. That's, that's the the test of faith amidst that fire is he is still good. Yeah. And not good like yellow smiley face, but good as in I'm trusting the, 
the goodness of you are carrying Has things that I don't you. know. You have knowledge of the things that I don't know. My my circumstance is 0.0001% of the entire equation that you are dealing with and I don't understand it. It actually looks like it's not good, but I'm trusting your goodness. Like if it's yeah. if that's if all of his goodness is not banking on your situation, yeah. then that's a healthy faith, right. right? Like I've I've seen people who um have been devout Christians and and devout Christians and they're their goodness was God's going to give me a spouse one day. I'm going to fast for an entire year and God's going to give me a spouse because that's good and that's God's goodness. And when that year happened, one, this person was hungry at the end of the year and single and there was no spouse and all of God's goodness was banking on that. And because this person did not have a spouse at the end of their one year fast, he's no longer good because all of his goodness was banking on this one situation and he had left the faith, left the church, yeah. left his job, like missed all of his rent. Like everything meant nothing anymore because God wasn't good anymore because of this one situation. And I, and I do want to say like, it is a legitimate question to ask, why is God allowing this to happen? Uh, because of our gospel of everything's going to go well, we're often shocked when something happens. Yeah. And, and then we question God. A lot of the times the answers just are, are right there. But it is true that it is not a bad question, though. It's no. all through the scriptures, like, how long, O oh Lord? Yeah, why? Exactly. I mean, mm-hmm. all, like, it is, it is all. all. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we're not trying to say you shouldn't uh, ask that question. Yes. Like wrestling or that you with shouldn't the, grieve or right. that you, you know. Yeah. But how are you going to ask? Like, what's that season going to look like? Yeah. And, and Suffer well and wait well. Yeah. And, and, and even that junior higher. At, at, that's that, amazing. That's like, that blew me away. And I was like, okay. But I was glad we were talking about it. Yeah. But she's someone that was thrown into that so much younger yeah. than yeah. than most of us have to face something like that. And he is okay. Like, things yeah. happen. It was a very long process up to now. He's all right. But to deal with the question of waiting well, suffering well, and not just thinking everything is going to go our way— because that is a quick way to lose yeah. your faith. Yep, and prepare for it. You know, we talked in an earlier podcast how my wife and I had decided when we had our daughter that we were going to have that conversation where we saw another family that we loved dearly lose their child to cancer at a very young age. He was four. And and we watched them go through that. And But as that was happening, you know, our daughter at the time was probably not even two yet. And I remember sitting down and saying, like, we love this girl, but we need to be prepared that if something happens mm. to her— We're going to choose to still say God is good. We're it's like, still going to follow the wow. Lord because— it's unimaginable what that's. I mean, it's every person who's gone through that, that's probably the greatest pain they can ever mm-hmm. experience is the loss of a child. And I thought, why would we assume that's not going to touch our life in yeah. some way? Uh, I even still think about it now. You know, now she's 13. I still think about it. Like, it still could happen. We know people that lost their teens. We know people that lost young adults. Yeah. Like, like when that happens, and if that happens, we need to be prepared for those things to yeah. say yeah. that we remember that we live in this fallen world. So I remember when you told me that. That hit me so hard. And this was a recent thing that, because we were talking, we talk about this a lot uh, off camera, guys. But like, we were having one of these conversations and I'm like, yeah, you got to be prepared. And you told me you had that conversation. I was like, that is so deep. Like to yeah. literally sit with your partner and be like, this hasn't happened yet, but what if it does? Yeah. To go like, there. We are wow. going to decide ahead of time. God is still good. And we're going to choose like to even have those plans in motion, to have that conversation, to even say it out loud mm-hmm. is so powerful. Because mm-hmm. it's a way to prepare. So in two decades yeah. of ministry, young know, adults watching the reasons that people drop out, I didn't want to be one of those people that yeah. didn't prepare well. And I knew that for us, that would be yeah. a soft spot that we had to yeah. do. All right. So number three is uh, number three way to lose your faith by 30, if you want to make sure you do that, is overcorrect. Uh, for the perceived hypocrisy of others in the church, and sometimes it's not perceived, sometimes it's actual, uh, to see hypocrisy in the church and to overcorrect for that, overreact to it, uh, and to also assume that everybody that you see in church is actually following Jesus. And this is kind of where the pendulum swings to the other side. Uh, in our younger uh, ages, we are most prone uh, to wag our fingers at the world and to feel like a self-righteousness and to see all sorts of problems and to kind of overreact to the other extreme. So you might see somebody being treated very poorly in church. You might see the church doing something. Uh, you might see a friend that claims to follow Jesus doing exactly the opposite every other day of the week. Uh, it might be your parents. It might be your community. You might look around and go, and then you get to say this like self-righteous, like if that's who Jesus is, 
then yeah. I'm out, right? Yeah. And the assumption that was made there, first of all, you're swinging to the other extreme. Let's be clear. Like you're throwing the whole thing away over whatever it is these issues are. Um, but you've made an assumption, which is if that's who Jesus is, and you've based it on all of these, these other people, broken examples yeah. of following Jesus, and I would say some may not even be following Jesus. That's the yeah. biggest discernment that we can make. That's why That's our podcast true. is Jesus versus America, because you might be following people American or seeing culture people. culture yep. that just yeah. show up to church because it's the American thing to do and, ha and have no idea what it is yeah. to follow Jesus. Or, or they may be a newer believer who doesn't true. even, they're not following yeah. Jesus really well yet, or they are struggling with their own stuff, yep, yeah. just like you. Yeah. Um, but I think that's the fallacy we make where we say, well, if that's who Jesus is, then I want yeah. nothing to do with it. You go from one extreme of watching whatever it is that you might even be yeah. right to decry. It's like growing up with parents that maybe had a horrible marriage and you're like, I'll never get married because that's the example you saw. Mm. And you're right. like, but there are healthy marriages out there. Like it doesn't have to be that way. I think it's similar to the last question of like, if we're banking all of our goodness on the circumstance, it's like, are we banking our faith on a person, on a human being also? Like the face of yeah. those people. And I think God uses people to uh, influence one another and build the faith and discipleship. But um, something I, um, my husband and I are asking is like, if our pastor commits a big scandal and something happens, are we going to be okay? <laughs> um, what it, Are we going to leave this church? What's going to be a lie and what's still true? Um, kind of like the insurance, it's very different, but insurance like you have with your daughter, with your wife, like, are we going to be okay if our heroes of the faith fall? And it just seems like every, with every passing year, another hero falls to yeah. another um, scandal. Because your hope can't be in that. You know, person. personality, that charismatic, whatever it should be. And this is an important God. thing to bring up because right now our culture is fascinated with documentaries about churches where there's been leaders yeah. falling. Whether, whether, I watch all of them yeah. too. I love them so we're, much. We're aware. We love them too. They're, actually, they're some of my favorites. That's the problem is when you're like sitting there going, <laughs> this is going to be kind of weird. Hope. We know, should assess is. that addiction we, of ours. We, there's something because we probably feel like a catharsis through it, which. Well, because when you see it, and you're, we are also frustrated with stuff like that. So yeah. it's like, well, fine. Finally, that truth came out and like, you I know. know, there's a little bit. But does bit, it help? Because at yeah. the end, I like hate church for like a few hours. Yeah, and, there, <laughs> and there's a little bit of us where we're kind of like neener, neener, neener. We should be very careful of that. But yeah. but whether it's like the rise and fall of Mars Hill or any of these things about Hillsong, all the different things that are out there. I think that question, though, is really important because even if we live in a moment where there's going to be like a documentary about a failure, uh, or we all think, oh, look at all the people who lost their faith and they were on the testimonial part of the mm -hmm. thing. I actually think that when I've been asked that question, and as you've talked about it, I thought we should not lose our faith over that. Yes, it might happen. And that person bears a responsibility yeah. because they led others and they were leading others. So let's not say that they have no responsibility. Right. But, you know, remember Jesus' words were, you know, it's better that a millstone be tied around your yeah. neck and be thrown into the yeah. sea that you cause any of these to stumble. So when you have these failures, it can cause people to stumble. That's a known consequence that they bear responsibility for. But to prepare ourselves, yeah. we also bear responsibility to say, okay, I should know, and I do know logically, but somehow it never gets to my heart that I'm following an imperfect human being. Yeah who is not disclosing all the sins that they are committing. Right. Uh, and because they'd be run off the stage if they did. And by the way, so would all of us, right? Oh, yeah. And so one day, as Jesus tells us, everything will be brought into the light. <laughs> At one yeah. day, earlier than the judgment, it gets brought into the light. Yeah. Um, why does that completely shock me that they're just as broken as I am? And so if I overreact to that, and I, I'm not saying you shouldn't be hurt and shocked and surprised. Yeah. You might leave that church. Maybe you might need to go somewhere else. But if, you know, the biggest test of our, whether you're following Jesus or whether you're following- or the institution. Right, or a, culture, a church member. The person. Right, is the idea what happens of getting in your way, the idea of a perfect life, all those things that are sort of idols, really, that you are placing yeah. on a pedestal that don't work out as opposed to the foundation- yeah. And I think <clears throat> it's a good point, like just a good distinction that it's the overcorrection we're talking about because there are some, you know, valid reasons of maybe you wanting to leave a particular church or or the church really has hurt you or like there's there's valid reasons for having concerns, but it's 
the overcorrection of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak, yeah. um, that's like an easy way to lose your faith. When you're not being measured, you're like, wait, am I overreacting? Hold on. Let me take a minute. It doesn't necessarily have to be the complete opposite direction. Let me take a second to regroup and assess a situation. Yeah. I know we're a young adults podcast, but if there's any ministers tuning in too, like I feel like a good thing for them to assess is are your congregants going to be okay without you? And are you setting them up to not rely on you to be the sole person for yeah. to represent God? Because yeah. um, I had been to a church where um, – my pastor was so um, put on a pedestal, as you had said. And as a teenager, I had just, whatever he said was God's will. And so when he had said something that I felt like was contradictory to what I felt God was do- doing in my life, it felt so confusing for me yeah. and very hurtful. And um, it caused a lot of damage in my faith. I, and then for the young adult that is watching, um, check the people that you are calling your pastors and your elders and your spiritual leaders, how much... Are you are you going to be okay when they when they fall? Also, um, are they having you rely on them too much? And what does your faith look? Are you just naturally relying on them too much? Which is, it, by the way, it's good to rely on people. It's good to be amongst the body of believers and have accountability and discipleship and whatnot. But um, what is your faith going to look like? Is it going to stand without this one person? Yeah, and be careful of generalizations because those are the lazy ways to subscribe to this rule. Like, Mm. oh, the church, they're too involved in political things. Oh, the church, they just all supported Trump in that one election. Oh, the church, you know, they're so racist internally. Oh, the They're lined up around all the Chick-fil-A's to prove that we're— And I do that sometimes. I do generalizations. Those generalizations are going to be the ones where now you're not even overcorrecting over an actual issue. You're correcting over a perceived— or generaliz- generalized issue, yeah. and we can all find a those. Stigma, I do. Stereotype. Yeah. Right? I'm always mad that all these crazy voices in our faith speak for me somehow, or yeah. get the mic and say the most insane things. <laughs> right? Like, oh. As you have a mic here, and you're on the- <laughs> that's why we're doing this. We're like somebody has to jump in the fray here. They're but, starting podcasts like, and like, put yeah, them, you know, getting putting on these. YouTube. Like, oh my god, don't trust those people. But but at the They're same crazy. time, like. Own your faith to the degree that if all you're going to do is look at these generalizations, which in broad strokes, some of them are true, but it's not true. And this is the important part. It's not true of every body of Christ. And more importantly, it's not true of Christ most of the time. And that's that's the thing is, who are you following again? And that's why I think our mistake is we just assume, oh, all those people are faithfully following Jesus. And a good example, somebody brought up to me and says, like, my church is standing against helping people trying to cross the border and make it through the desert. They're standing against those people. I'm like, all right, listen, that's a nuanced issue, Ooh. right? What's the government's role? Like, what's the role of a nation? But but that's not Jesus anyway, right? Like, we could get into a discussion over, like, how God works through governments and how God works through border patrols and how God is supposed to do all these things. And maybe it'll be nuanced, maybe it won't. But you know what? I think Jesus would be down there giving clothing and shelter and, and food and water, right? Thank and so you. who are you following? And if you overreact against those people, uh, you've detonated your faith for no yeah. good reason, right? So Let's stay away from that overcorrection. Um, all of us have a tendency, Critical especially thinking. in our yeah. young adult years, to just <laughs> overcorrect, make some declarative statement, and walk out. What are you walking out on? You're actually sometimes not even uh, looking at examples of people who follow Jesus. Number four, best way uh, to lose your faith is to bulk up on emotional experiences and sentimental faith uh, rather oh. than the God who's revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, and the way he's revealed in scripture, to not know Jesus, not know his voice, not know anything about him, not really be following him, not understand mm. how God has revealed to us. Just like how it makes you feel? Just the feelings that and the experiences. That was me for the first four years of my faith. Tell us. The first four years of my faith were <laughs> very search, much that. Searching for that high. I am a self-admitted <laughs> emotional high-seeking, or I was. Um, I feel like I swing the other way now, so maybe we need to recover some of that emotionalism. Um, but... I my conversion story was very emotional, and I think there, it, and that's a, I'm not going to go into my that my testimony on that for the sake of time. But I think that's good, and that's true, and that's God. That moment, my my conversion story. But I think um, the mistake that I can't have put to blame on anyone is I, because that was my conversion, that that would be my discipleship and my journey following Jesus. So, and I grew up in a very charismatic church, so it fostered a lot of that. Like, you should be crying, you should be dancing, you should be 
praying for intense miracles, not, you know, a miracle to just get through your nine to five job. It's like intense, like tumor gone and whatever. Um, and so I thought that that's how you, I sustain my faith because that is how it begun. Um, my conversion was around like 15 years old. Um, and that's when I fell in love with Jesus, but I fell in love with scripture at 22. And that's when it became, oh, I'm rel- I don't need um, the high um, adrenaline moments. Um, I just, I, I find God in the word. I find it in, in contemplative prayer. I find it in liturgy. I find it in community and um, admitting my sins to someone and being held accountable. Wow, God, you are in various o- other wonderful, beautiful ways. Um, but I remember that in that period where I was chasing high emotions, when the emotions weren't high, I felt like something was wrong between me and God. I felt like I was doing something wrong or I felt like the environment wasn't. There's a book on that. What's that book? Do you remember? I don't. Morgan was telling us about it. It's about like, it's about this and like the distance you feel and why you don't like emotionally feel God's presence. And like people are constantly seeking seeking that. And the book is about sometimes God like pulls away because it's like, don't seek the high. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I'm talking about like the experience over the centuries of the dark night of the soul that like people like, like his presence is pulled in other words for us to not get used to that. Yeah. Actually, he does work to us in that. But I think that's really like to say what is wrong with the emotionalism is, you know, here's the news bulletin. God's will is expressed in scripture and in the <laughs> in the person of Jesus, yeah. right? Yeah. Like all of us, and we might even do a whole episode just on how do I find God's will in my life, but yeah. it's in the scripture. It's not a fleeting it's not, it's not hidden. And it's, it's not something you have to necessarily earn also, because I think that's what I had also felt is like, I'm not doing enough or these people aren't fostering a spiritual environment enough or the... Honestly, I hate to admit it, the worship wasn't in tune with the spirit enough. So that's why I can't worship right, right now because it's not hitting yeah. the same. Or worship, yeah, I'd, I'd say things like worship was off tonight, like as if it's oh, their God. responsibility. Right. Well, that's because we're looking for that emotional high. And yeah. I think this is the issue is that is that if we're going to follow God's will, if we're going to follow Jesus, we have to know his voice. We have to know what he teaches. We have to know what he's like. We have to know the character that we need to adopt. We have to know what God wills for us. And I don't mean like, does he want you to go to this school or that school? I mean like, what kind of person does he want you to be? Like what's actually being said? Like the educated, what is the message here? Because that's also a good way for people to fall into cults or high stakes religion or whatever it is because – Maybe they're used to that. They're like, this must be true because I'm feeling like this it's, emotional rush and there isn't like the right. intellectual moment to be like, it's not about how I feel, like what's actually being said. And no here. one, I and I didn't have the, like in my first, in those four years of like high emotions, I didn't, I was celebrated for the experiences I had, not for how much I was in my word. I was celebrated for how I worshiped and um, the the like, the, the tears that I would have at the end of a service. Yeah. People would be like, oh, wisdom, so like whatever. But I was, but I never got a pat on the back for for exegeting scripture and reading the gospels and really yeah. knowing what Jesus was saying on the Sermon yeah. on the Mount. And that was like kind of like And sometimes there's a pride behind that too. I'm not saying for yeah. you necessarily, but I think people feel like prideful, like I'm somehow closer to God because I'm feeling or, or expressing. Yeah. I don't in have this to listen way. to that cold doctrinal stuff. <laughs> yeah. I'm not into that cold theology. Yeah. And and the I just thing have is, a relationship with God right? and it's and this is why personal. it leads you to lose your faith. Because yeah. if you don't know your faith, you don't know what the faith teaches, you don't know what Jesus yeah. says. You don't know change. what his will. Yeah. yeah, when you lose the feelings or they go away, or again, one of those things we talked about earlier, like suffering befalls you. Yeah. You've not learned anything except how to just get goosebumps, right? Yeah. And to have the the hairs on the back of your neck stand up and yeah. worship. And when I was l- watching that, that Hillsong documentary, one of the interesting things they said that I just kind of, I knew, but I'd never really thought about was he said the music was the gateway drug yeah. that brought people into the church. And if you, even if I hadn't watched a documentary, if you had said like, like, what's one of your issues with Hillsong? I'd say, well, I don't know. It's great that they're so big and they've got this great music, but their theology has always been so off. And all these people are standing there, like, listening to stuff that I just think is just baloney sometimes. 
But when the high of the music yeah. drew people in and they got that experience, and again, it was like being at a concert, like you are just getting high after high and your favorite mm. beautiful singers are on stage singing your favorite beautiful mm. songs. Yeah. And then a guy got up and just said a bunch of stuff that was just sometimes nonsense. Uh, you had no idea because yeah. you weren't there but uh, they speak it in like a tone that is high adrenaline. Is. You just you missed that that it's was not even scriptural, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, you, it's almost manipulative. Yeah. And I've known worship pastors who have pro like issues with worship and choose to do it differently because they're like, I don't like how we're like going up on this one part to make people feel, and then we can adjust the music this way, or when we're about to talk about this, then the music. They're like, we're gonna invite the band up as I do a really mm -hmm. dope prayer right yeah, now. Yeah, Come yeah. and find. And it can feel very <laughs> manipulative. Yeah, and we can't. And, and, and sometimes in a nefarious way, it can be used depending on like the church or the situation, whether it's healthy or not. But we cannot depend. That's the whole point. Right. We cannot depend on these manipulations. We cannot depend no, and, on and, the feeling, the emotion, the high, the whatever's triggering the spiritual And that's what experience. got me out of that was when I was in that high emotionalism, like kind of pra faith practice is four years later, I went through some serious crap and the worship, like going to a worship service where the music was hidden right and it would have been what I considered spirit-filled, it didn't save me from the depression I was going through, the anxiety I had, the health issues my mom was going through and all the other stuff I had going on. I needed something else. And I was like, yeah. oh, I, I I can't reach this emotional high. Um, and then I, I just felt like it's like, I don't know. I just felt There's like God was like- something wrong with your spirituality now. It's like, no, you're not- you didn't do anything wrong. Like, let me meet you in my word. Let me yeah. let me sit with you in prayer. Yeah. Like, and I and when I finally like became um, in love with scripture and quietness <laughs> and contemplativeness and and just who Jesus said he was in in his yeah. gospels, and I just sat with that. It was it was not grounding. It was grounding. Yeah. It was an anchor. Like it wasn't. And it goosebumps in a different way, in a way that I can come back to and not have to question yeah. and not have to earn yeah. also is when, huge. When you find like Jesus' words touching your heart in a way that just brings that same feeling, you know you're yeah. in a good place. And I and I think the other thing, let, let, let's just be clear. The other things we talked about, like how to, how to answer who God is and no questions about him, how to learn to suffer well, like how to understand following Jesus versus just following people who look like they're following Jesus. Like you can't do these things if you're just looking for the high. Yeah. yeah. That said, as but the somebody spirit who's, does exist, right? That the, yeah. like as somebody, somebody who first loves music, right? I think yeah. we all do, and I believe that God speaks to us uniquely through music. Yes. Yeah. But let's be clear: this emotionalism and this experience is not just a music thing. But but if you're somebody out there who's like, oh, what are you guys talking about? Like, I feel so close to God during music. It was designed that yes. way. Yes. Every faith in the world it's not that uses it's bad. music, yes. right? No, no, right. Yeah. But that can't be the basis of your faith. Right. Like right. God has given us this beautiful gift of music, just like He gave us the beautiful gift of tasting things, yeah. right? Yeah. It is so beautiful. It speaks to us in ways that words can't, yeah. and it just takes us to places. Right. So we acknowledge that. And the and, spirit does move, and right. you can't, and there are, yes. look, we we have this faith, we can't de, like, uh, uh, you know, what is the word I'm looking for? Demystify, right? De, right? Yeah. Where we're taking everything mm -hmm. yeah. that's spiritual and faith-based out, and we're just you right. can't yeah. do that either because yeah. the spirit does exist. And you might I've had experiences. Yeah. They're not every day, and they yeah. usually have a purpose. I always ask yeah. God, like, what is this? What's the yeah. purpose? What's happening? So it's not that you can't have these spiritual experiences or feel God's presence, or or that He's not going to draw closer to you in a way that's like you can't explain and does give goosebumps when you're at your lowest and maybe you needed it yeah. or whatever. Yeah. But it's the seeking that. It's, yes. It's, it's making that the validation that I'm a good person, yes. I'm a good Christian. It's that. Is, because how can not emotions be a part that. of it when you hear about let justice flow like a river in the yeah. desert? How could that not make yeah. you want to tear up if you're if you're really sitting in that? And that's why I say like I don't think my conversion story is— I don't. I don't throw it out. Like I think that no, that's true and good. It. Yeah. Because I think if we were all honest, our testimonies we would sound like charismatics. Yeah. Every one of we, our <laughs> testimonies are yeah. littered with God's no, amazing work true. in our life. Right. Yeah. And sometimes I go back to those places mentally too. When yes. when when you doubt and you're like, what if all of this is just? And I'm like, no. But I right. had that moment our, where that's inexplicable. Our testimonies. 
are often, we sound like charismatics. Uh, the problem is our discipleship. Yeah. We need to sound more like maybe evangelical <laughs> Christians. We're yeah. Like where we're actually yeah. like not letting every day be some wild mystical experience yeah. and following God in that way. Because otherwise, what, what's the purpose of him giving the example of his son and his word to us? Because that's a big part of it. So I want to acknowledge those things and say they're real and they're important. Yeah. Um, I'm often asked sometimes like, well, don't you think those are the things, those experiences are what bring people to Jesus? And this is subtle because I Ooh. think in our churches, people Ooh. believe that. Yeah. And I would say, okay, look. But you would hope not because if that's the thing that brought you, that's, that's not going to last. That's not going to sustain, Ooh. right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I go back to Jesus on this in the way that when he was telling the story, it's a parable. So he's in the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. Oh, he's talking about the, the rich man's like, oh, go back and tell my brothers that I'm in this place of torment. Please go back and tell them, send send Lazarus to tell yeah. them. And, and you know, the, the character says, Lazarus can't go back and neither can you. And and the, and, and Jesus, you right, Je <laughs> Jesus says like, he he's the one narrating the parable. And he has the rich man say, yeah, but if somebody rises from the dead, they'll believe. And Jesus telling the parable in probably the most sorrowful mm -hmm. tone ever mm -hmm. because he knows even this is going to yes, He says, even if a him. man should rise from the dead, they will not believe him. And you could just feel the yeah. irony of Jesus saying that, knowing that he's going to die and be resurrected yeah. and billions of people are still going to say, eh. You know, so the <laughs> most cosmic experience of all time cannot bring people into the faith, says Jesus, who actually goes through that event and but knows. But your fog machines and your lights will. Yeah. Or <laughs> just, just all the, yeah. the miraculous and all that stuff. And yeah. people say to me, like, like, that's what Jesus wanted. And I'd say, look, I, I'm telling you, I could levitate you right now on camera, and there'll be people who are like, nah, that's not real. Or even if that <laughs> but, happened, but, you know. But he still does it. He does. He still does it. He does. God still acts and God still yes. does that stuff. But if our if our faith is yeah. made On up, yeah, alone, if, if, if that's, that's the, the drug foundation. of our faith, yeah. then there's going to be long periods of time. You know, like even at the birth of the church in the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit was poured out in the church, I remember one, one guy calculated that the Holy Spirit makes about 28 appearances in the book of Acts over a 30-year history. Like if you're thinking at the birth of the church, like— this wasn't like in everyone's life every, every single, single day, day right? Yeah. This was like in the life of the early church. Yeah. It was like, what, once a year? Now, I know it was probably happening a lot more, right? But in the recorded times, they didn't focus on that. What yeah. they focused on was they met together. They broke bread yep. together. They taught the word together. Paul, they, his, his conversion story was super charismatic right. on the road to Damascus. Right. And then when you, after he has that crazy conversion story, this crazy moment— he goes and writes to all these churches, and he's not telling them to go have that moment right. also. He's, he's being theological. He writes the theology <laughs> of the New Testament. He talks about, it, right? like, roles in the church and different things like that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. if your faith is based entirely on experience and good vibes and all of those good things, vibes. you know, then— People will search that yeah. for their whole life. <laughs> I know. Right. Jump from belief to belief. Right. It yeah. may end. Yeah. You may not feel it. But more importantly, you'll miss out on the way God has revealed himself. And the yes. person of Jesus in the Scripture and the way that he's revealed his will to us there. Yeah. This is what I want you to know. This is who I want you to be. This is what I want you to follow. And that anchoring um, feeling. Right. And you could be somewhere who week after week after week, like I've done, raises your hand to worship, raises your hand and feels good, looks for the miraculous, and that's great. Do it because I've seen miraculous stuff. I, I, I should be a charismatic with all the miraculous that I've seen, and I, and I probably still could be. But the main point is that's not what I'm basing my faith on. Right. I'm basing it on Jesus, and you're not going to find him outside the Scripture just in every worship song. Like we said, we're going to one day do an episode just on all the heresy found in worship songs uh, that we all <laughs> sing week after week after week after week. But also and wreck me, yeah, too, because yeah. Yeah, yeah, you'll we'll never never I love that song. I'm like, we'll yeah. We'll never worship again. Yeah, no, yeah we'll, we'll go through that. So that's the fourth way. The, the last one, we're just going to point you to another podcast. Uh, the fifth way uh, to lose your faith by 30 is to try to live the Christian life by yourself and do it entirely on your own. We've done another podcast on why being part of the body of Christ is so, so important, important, and we'll point you to that one. Uh, but of course, we don't want you to lose your faith by 30. Of course, the whole reason we're doing this is to try to demonstrate a better way of following Jesus and three generations trying to do that. So tell us what you think. This is Jesus versus America, and we'll be back with another podcast. Follow us on all social media platforms at Jesus vs. America. 
and find more resources on our official website, jesusversusamerica.com.